everyone welcome to episode number 67 of the bill podcast and in this episode we'll be going through swift which is a pretty new like a few years old programming language from apple and it is open source as well so let me first go through a few links and over the course of the links i will explain more about swift the first one is actually called one language by martin fowler it was written almost 10 years ago almost a decade but it basically says uh, why we should learn more than one programming language as a developer as a programmer because it can help to expand our paradigm and for 2016 I have decided to pick up Swift in an effort to learn iOS programming but also maybe Android like what I hear from the news but hey who knows at least uh, this programming language will help me understand the fundamentals of programming even better along with my current suit of languages that I know. So let's go through Swift specific uh, websites. So the very first one is uh, in, found in developer.apple.com because it is an open source language that is being actively developed and led by Apple group of engineers. So you can have a look at this page for a brief overview. And they also provide some guide to Swift. So you can go to learn Swift and go through a quick Swift tour. And there is also a page on the Swift resources, the sample code, iTunes course, videos, guides and references under Swift resources. And uh, yes, the Swift tour, which will kind of give you a brief overview. And I'll also go through many of the concepts found in Swift tour through this screencast. So why don't we go ahead and install Swift? So if you have Xcode and if you download the, the latest version, it will already come with Swift 2 compiler. And over here about Xcode, you will see that I'm already running the latest version, which is Xcode 7.3. So the next thing I'll do is come to my command line and let's do a few command line checks about Swift. So let's do Swift dash dash version. So it shows that I'm running the version 2.2, which is the latest one. Along with uh, version check, I also like to do dash dash help, which will give me the common options that are available. And finally, I also like to know where is the executable Swift being run from. So I like to do which Swift and uh, yep, it is pretty commonly found under USR slash bin. So in this screencast, we will only use the Swift compiler through the command line and we will also write the code in a text editor. So no complicated IDE or iOS framework. We will just focus on the bare language. So as usual, we will only go through some of the features that are possible and hopefully it's a stepping stone for all of you to go in depth with all the resources that are already found online. So as usual, the very first thing we will do is come into a totally empty folder. And uh, as usual, the first thing that we try out in any language is a Hello World program. So let me open this uh, folder up in a text editor, which is obviously completely empty as of now. So let me create a file called print.swift. So in Swift, the file extension is simply .swift. So you can use any text editor, Notepad in Windows or Atom, Sublime, or even Vim or Emacs. And the very first thing we will do is simply print hello world. And in Swift, it's pretty easy. It's hello and then world, that's it. And we will come back to the command line and the way we will execute it is simply Swift and then the file name. In this case, it is one-print.swift. And there you see it will say hello world. So now that we are uh, comfortable with running a Swift file, why don't we go through the next concept of any programming language and that is the variable. So I'm just gonna create a file called var and uh, also let. So let's see what the two of them do. So in Swift, you can declare a variable in two ways. One is mutable, one is non-mutable. So let's uh, talk about uh, mutable. So let's say you have a mutable uh, variable means you can change this variable value and it's called room temperature. So let's say it is 25 degrees Celsius and uh, I'm going to change it and let's bring it down to 20 degrees Celsius. And why don't we go ahead and print this out? So in Swift, once again, I'll just execute the file name and there you see, you'll see 20. 
Now, if you want to declare a constant and you want your program to not change this variable at all. So in this case, we will declare it with let. And in this case, why don't we try say speed of light, which is definitely not changeable. And it is uh, almost 300 million meters per second. So why don't we try to change the speed of light, speed of light, and uh, let's round it up. And why don't we try to print it? And let's see what happens when we try to run or compile the file. You will see that there is an error, cannot assign value is a let constant. So Swift will not allow you to change the value. So why don't I comment this out? And now let's try to run it. And there you see the room temperature here in this case is mutable and the speed of light definitely not mutable. So you can declare a variable or a let as we saw before. So in this case, let's say we call it implicit integer and we can declare it as 70. So in this case, you do not really need to explicitly say that uh, this is an integer. And we can also similarly declare an implicit double. And in this case, we will simply put a dot zero to say that it is a double. But sometimes we do want to put in a round number with no decimal place, but maybe it is a double. In that case, you need to explicitly declare it. So explicit and let's call it double. In that case, you can declare the type with a colon here and then double. And let's call it 90. So even though you see we are having an integer, this is actually a double. So when we print explicit double, so once again, Swift 3, you see that it is 90.0. So you can either declare it without a type. In this case, it will try to uh, guess the type. And if you want to be really, really sure that the program really takes in what you desire, then just explicitly declare it as a certain type. Next, we will do a little bit of a string and we will learn how to print with strings. So once again, I'll declare a non-mutable variable and let's call it moon missions. And in this case, there are 72 of them. And let's also have Mars missions. And in this case, there are 38 of them so far. So let's declare a string. So let's say Mars summary. And you can say there are so-and-so Mars missions till today. So let's say you want to declare this number as part of the string here. You will need to have a backslash and then round brackets, and then you can write the number here, Mars missions. Why don't we try to print this out? So print Mars summary. And when you try to print, there you go. There are 38 missions still today. And you can also do a little bit of arithmetic inside these brackets. So let's have a moon summary. So I'm going to copy the same thing here and uh, there are moon missions. There are more moon missions. So in this case, I do want to subtract. So Mars moon missions minus Mars missions. So why don't I go ahead and print? This is moon summary. So let's execute this file. And here you will see there are 34 moon missions till today. Maybe my sentence is a bit wrong. So let me correct it. There are, so let me execute this. And there you see 38 Mars missions and 34 more moon missions till today. And a little bit of trivia in case you're wondering where I got this information from. It's from this infograph here. So I just got this number 72 and 38 from this URL. I will link it in the code. So I'm going to create another one, array dictionary dot Swift. And in this case, uh, why don't we declare a variable called IP, which is internet protocol, the short form, and it will basically be an array of strings. So if you want to declare an array of string or rather initialize it in Swift, this is the syntax. You need to declare the type and then this is to instantiate it. So why don't we just uh, say IP? And this is pretty similar to many programming languages, uh, just a square bracket and then uh, comma separated ones. Why don't we try to print IP and see how it looks like? So Swift five dash, and there you see link layer, which is the lowest layer, then inter internet, transport and application. 
So if you want to replace one of them, uh, as similar to many programming languages, this will start with zero index, one, two, three. Why don't we try to rename the third one as simply app? So IP and then three for the index equals to app. And why don't we try to print once again after we replace index three with app? So there you see application gets replaced with app. In some programming language, it is known as hash as well. So let's take a look at the layers of the internet protocol. So it will start with square bracket and here you will start defining them. So let's say link. Link in this case will consist of an array of strings and let's start with say ethernet and let's also declare another layer which is transport. Why don't we try to print it out? Print layers and there you see the dictionary is being printed out right here. So if you want to add on in this case, so why don't we add on another node and in this case let's add on app and why don't we try to print out the added one. Ooh, there is an error. So let's see what happens. Of course, it's not layer, it's layers as I declared it right here. So you see Swift will try to catch any form of uh, syntactical error. So let's try to run it and there you see the app layer is added on. So this is a very simple the example of array and dictionary. Next, let's try to look at control flow and we will look at, say, the common for loop and if else case. And why don't we declare another array? And in this case, it will be planet mass. And if you're wondering where I got these numbers from, they are from a Wikipedia page. I'm basically getting this row, which is taking Earth as relative uh, as one and then the rest of the planets relative to the Earth's mass. So this is the array of planet mass in our solar system. So I'm going to declare, say, var terrestrial planet mass. And I'm going to explicitly declare it as a double equals to zero. And similarly, I'm going to have another variable. And this will be Jovian planet mass. And also explicitly declared as double equals to zero. So in Swift, this will also look very similar as in other programming language. So for mass in planet mass. So this is how I will iterate through the array planet mass and each of the array element will be known as mass and they are curly braces. And uh, why don't we go through some if else case. So if mass is less than one or sorry, more than one, which is uh, more than Earth's mass, then I will simply add to Jovian planet mass plus equals to mass. Else, I will add it to terrestrial planet mass plus equals to mass. So basically, terrestrial will be the, the rocky planets, the Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and the Jovian planets will be the rest of them, the big gaseous giant planets. Why don't we try to print them out? So print terrestrial planet mass is and uh, we are gonna declare it terrestrial planet mass earth mass because that is the unit and similarly we will also have jovian planet and we will have jovian planet mass let's run this so as you see this is the four in which will iterate through each of the elements in the array and you also have the control flow if else the syntax is pretty simple. I would say if you have uh, been through other programming language, this should not look anything different. So why don't we run it? Swift six and control flow. And there you see terrestrial mass is really, really tiny as compared to the Jovian planet mass, which is really almost like beyond 400 times the earth mass. Next, let's go through a concept called optional. And I admit that uh, I found it a little challenging to understand this. But uh, from one beginner to another, I'll explain it the way I understood so far. So let's uh, try to have a variable once again. So say var spacecraft. And it will be a string. So I will explicitly declare it as type string. And let's call it Voyager. Why don't we try to print it out? And simply spacecraft. This should be pretty easy nothing to do with optional yet file number seven and there you see it's Voyager 
Now in Swift, there is a concept called it can be a certain type or it can be nil. And that is the concept of optional. So why don't we declare this as say nil? Let's see what happens. So I'm going to run the file once again. And obviously it will give me an error because hey, you explicitly declared it as string. It cannot be nil. But sometimes, you know, during our programming, maybe we query some API and the return is nil. In this case, you can declare it as an optional with a question mark. So now if I execute it, it will not throw an error and it will simply say nil. So if I put it as question mark, it means it can either be nil or a string. So I will once again put it as a string just to show you. And yep, it will say that it is optional Voyager. Why does it say optional Voyager? Because when I'm printing out, it is not printing out the type string anymore. It is printing out optional. So in this case, you can unwrap it with an exclamation mark right here. So now when I execute it, it will give you Voyager without saying that, hey, it is of type optional. So I hope this is a little bit clearer. Let's say var greeting. And in this case, we'll simply say hello. And uh, let's also say there is an alien. And let's give it a string, which can be an optional. And uh, let's say it is a fellow humanoid. So I can print alien in this case. So let's see what the Swift gives. And yep, it will give you fe optional fellow humanoid. And once again, you will need to unwrap it and say that, hey, you know, if, if string, it is, if it is really string, please unwrap it and exclamation mark. And in this case, it will give you fellow humanoid. Now this can be pretty cool for some checks. Like I say, if you make some API calls and you do not really know whether it will be nil or string. In this case, we can do a little check. So let's say let life equals to alien and we will declare it as life. Why don't we print greeting? Let's try it once again. And there you see, hello, fellow humanoid. But obviously there might or might not be an alien. So in this case, it might be nil. So in this, oops, there's a lot of error. What happened? I will remove this print alien. So let's see. Yep, in this case, it will simply say hello if the alien is nil. And finally, because of uh, optional, we can have some very neat checks. So let's say we have a nickname and it is of type optional string and the nickname is Anna. And let's have a full name and it is explicitly just string. And in this case, it will be Anastasia. So let welcome equals to hi and we can do a pretty cool check here so nickname question question full name so it simply means that if it is nickname then yeah sure use Anna but if a nickname is nil go ahead and say it's the full name so why don't we try to print it print welcome and there you see it will say hello Anna because well we have a nickname but if it is nil in this case, let's try to execute it and see what's happened. It will say, hi, Anastasia. So I hope it gave you a brief uh, overview about what is an optional. Let's go through another control flow, which is switch case. So let me declare body and let's just say it is a planet name, say Mars. And let's do some switch cases, switch. And let's say if the body is Mars. So case Mars. In this case, I can just print it. And I'm just going to put a sentence about uh, one of the Mars missions. Mars Orbiter reached the Mars orbit in September 2014. And let's say another, there is another case. And it can be a few of them. Let's say it's Jupiter or Uranus or Pluto. And once again, colon. And I'm going to print another statement and it's about New Horizons this time. And finally, we can also put some checks in the case statement. So let's say we say let x where x dot uh, has prefix is comet. So let's do a print once again. And in this case, I'll do another mission. 
but I said it has prefix. So in this case, it has to be comet and then something. So why don't I say it's comet 67P. And finally, the last one is a default. That means no matter what the body is, it will simply say print hello cosmic missions. Why don't we run it? Uh, let's say the first one with uh, Mars as uh, what it says here. So I'm going to run switch and then eight. And yep, it's about Mars. So what if it is Uranus? So let me run it again. It will say New Horizon reach Pluto. What if it has a prefix? So comet and then 67P. And yep, Rosetta mission reached in August 2014. And if it is default, say in this case, say Venus, it will just be the default one, which is Hello Cosmic Missions. Next, we will go through something really simple, which is the limits. And it's quite handy as well. So number nine, limits.swift. And uh, this kind of reminds me of Ruby, actually. So for in, let's say zero to four, or rather zero to less than four. And why don't we print it out and see what we get? So simply print I. So let me go to the command line and uh, run number nine. And there is a little bit of error for in, sorry. There's a syntax error here. And there you see, you, you will get zero, one, two, three. So once again, the syntax is when you have dot dot and lesser than sign, it will be from zero to less than four. That means four is not included. But if you want to include four, it is pretty simple as well. All you need to do is three dots and then four. In this case, why don't we print I? I'm gonna just print some separators here just to show you the difference. And here you will see from zero to four and four is included. So once again, it's pretty Ruby-like and it's pretty handy as well. The next one that we are gonna do is functions, which is once again, very, very, integral to every programming language. So let's go through a function which is really simple and uh, it's just gonna be greet. And in Swift, it is pretty declarative. So apart from saying what is the name of the argument, we will also declare it as the type. And in this case, it will be the type string. And of course, curly braces. Uh, and inside here, we will uh, have the function body. But in Swift, we will also be declaring the return type of this function. In this case, it will simply be string. And uh, just like many programming languages, we will simply return with the keyword return and then hello. And uh, something that we learned previously, hello and then the name. Why don't we try to execute this? So we'll just say print greet and we will say Bob. So why don't we run it? So Swift and file number 10 and it will be hello Bob. Now this function takes in only one argument. Notice how I call it greet and then Bob, which is the value of the name that we're passing in. So let's say we have another function and it's simply called divide. It's a trivial example, but uh, I wanna show you the structure of this. And uh, so once again, we declare the first argument, which in this case is div dividend, and it will be of type integer. The second argument will be divisor, and it will be of type integer once again, and this will return the value double. And in this case, just return, say dividend divided by divisor. So a few things to note here. Firstly, when I say print, and if I say divide, so notice what happens when I say 20 and then two. I'm gonna try to execute it. Notice here it will say missing argument label divisor. So in Swift from the second argument onwards, you have to specifically explicitly declare that, hey, the name of the second argument is divisor. But if it only has the first argument or rather in both cases, the first argument does not need to be declared. So why don't we try to run this? And uh, it will say, cannot convert value of type integer to type double. Sorry, because I said double, right? 
so we can force it to be a double in this case so let's try to execute this and there you see you get 10.0 next let's go through another concept and this is called tuple and in this case uh, let's have another function and it's called calc so once again just as we learned previously we are gonna have a name of the argument which we do in all programming language but we also have to declare the type and in this case it will be type array of integers and we also have to declare the return type and in this case it will be a tuple of add which is of type integer of sub which is also of type integer and of area which is also of type integer and then we are going to have the function body so why don't we have add and then answer so in this case it will simply be num zero so let's just say we're going to pass in an array of uh, two values so num zero plus num one and then we are going to have uh, say sub answer and it's simply going to be num zero minus num one and let's gonna have a let area and it's gonna be num zero times num one and let's have a return and if you want to return the three values you can do it very simply with the use of a tuple and in this case we'll have a round bracket and we'll simply include the three values add answer sub answer and area call this so let's say let stats equals to calc and we are going to pass in an array of integers so say five and three so why don't we print out stats and see how does it look like so swift 11 tuple and this is how the tuple looks like round brackets and then 8 2 and 15 but this is pretty cool and the power of tuple can be seen here if you want to refer to only one of them you just simply need to say stats dot add which is basically the first of the three tuples and let's see how it looks like and it will give you eight if you don't want to say dot add you can also say zero but uh, i believe that sorry you can say dot zero but i believe that dot add is uh, much more declarative it's much more readable as well instead of uh, just giving a number so similarly you can also do a sub so sub and then sub is simply one so let's run it and yep it is two as you can see here this is two and uh, lastly you can also have area and this is two and in this case it will be 15. so once again tuple is a very handy way of uh, having something return as part of a function next let's have uh, something about the function arguments as well and uh, this is pretty similar to the next version of javascript which is es 2015 it's called spread operator i believe so let's have a sum of and instead of just two numbers sometimes you know we do not know how many arguments it will be so this is uh, how we kind of declare there is only one argument which is numbers and it is of type int but what if there are several of them in this case just like ES 2015 JavaScript we will just put in three dots and definitely you will have to put in the return value of this function or rather the return type which is int in this case so what we'll do is uh, we'll declare var sum equals to zero and now we will kind of iterate through it so var n in numbers which we do not know how many numbers they are because we do not know the number of arguments but we can iterate through it and we will do a summation which is uh, adding all the numbers and then simply we will return sum so why don't we print it so let's try to print and let's try to say uh, print sum off and there is nothing in this case let's try to run it so swift 12 and it will be simply zero because there is nothing so it will just return sum equals to zero but you can also have say one argument so let's say four and it will simply return four or you can have two arguments say four and five or four and six it will return ten or you can have three arguments four six ten 
and it will return 20 in this case. So you can go on and on. So this spread operator type, or uh, in this case, the three dots is pretty handy. So in Swift, uh, something like JavaScript, it has closure. So a function can uh, actually contain another function. So why don't we call it return func dot Swift. So what I mean by this is, let's say there is a function called cube and it does not take in any integer, but instead it returns a function. And the way we write it is uh, with a round bracket to say that, hey, it's gonna return a function. But within this function, we have to declare what this inner function takes in. And in this case, let's say it takes an integer and what this inner function returns. And in this case, it is integer once again. So this is pretty unique way of uh, saying that, hey, you know, the cube function returns another function that takes an argument int and returns another integer. So why don't we declare the function here that we declared? So let's just say it is power of three. And once again, as we declared, it's gonna take in a number of type int and it's gonna return an integer. So why don't we just say it's gonna return num times num times num. And it's gonna return power of three. All right, so why don't we try it out? So say var cuboid equals to cube. So basically you're calling this function, which does not take in any integer, but we're gonna print it and we're gonna say cuboid and we're gonna pass it say two. Why don't we see what happens? So I'm gonna run not 12, but 13. And there you see, it's gonna return us eight. So this is uh, like the first concept of closure, which is the next one that we are gonna go through. And this is something that I personally found a little bit challenging as well. So closure.swift. So once again, closure is as simple as a function within a function. So let's try to go through the concept. So let's say we have an array of numbers as simple as that, and it's gonna contain an array of integers. So three, nine, uh, 10, and 12. So I'm gonna go through three ways how a closure can be written in Swift. The number one way is simply numbers.map, and dot .map is something, once again, pretty similar to many programming languages, Python, JavaScript, Ruby. So you're gonna basically iterate through each of the elements in this array. So the way you do it here is that inside the map, there's gonna be another function. So one way of writing a closure is that you put in the function inside the curly brace. And the very first thing we have to do is declare the argument that it takes in and the return type. This is pretty common concept of uh, Swift that we have been going through. So it takes in num integer and it returns type integer. And we're gonna say in, and then we're gonna say what the function does. It's simply gonna return three times num. Why don't we try to print it? Print mul1. And there you see it's uh, basically three times three, nine, 27, 30, and 36. So this is one way of writing closure. The other way, and as I go through the three ways, you see that it will become more and more concise or very shorthand. So let's say the second way. In this case, it will still be numbers dot map. It will still be curly braces. But if we are sure of what the params are, you can totally omit this declaration. And you can simply do num in three times number. When I first saw this, it was a little confusing to me. So I had to do it a few times to kind of understand it. Why don't we try to print mul2. And there you see we have the same answers, but of course the way we wrote it is slightly more concise. The third way is even more concise. If we already know the arguments, we can refer it with a dollar sign. So in this case, we'll simply do dollar zero, which is the first argument, times three. And then we can simply do print and then mul3. Why don't we try it out? All right, so there is an error because it should be numbers. So let's try it out. So once again, the answers are exactly the same, but notice how the three ways are slightly different 
And the last way is the most concise of all. The last concept that we'll go through is something called class. And uh, the class concept is found in many, many programming language, including Ruby or ES2015. So I'm going to go through the very same example as my last episode, but we're going to write it in Swift programming language. It sometimes helps to write the same concept in another programming language and kind of contrast it. I feel that way it helps me understand the computer science fundamentals. So in this case, we'll declare a class called person. And why don't we declare the first few variables? So it will have a first name of type string. And it will also have a last name of type string. And this is how you do a constructor. So it will take in first name, which is of type string, and last name, which is also of type string, and self dot first name is equals to first name and self dot last name is equals to last name. And why don't we also define a function? And in this case, we will define a function called full name. And once again, it will not take in any arguments, but it will return string. So let's define it. It will simply return a string of first name space last name. Let me fix the syntax. That's it. Pretty simple. So why don't we try to use this class? So let's say var p equals to person and we're going to use first name as Igor and last name as Novak. And why don't we try to print it out? P dot full name. That's it. It doesn't take in any argument. So let's try to run it. Igor Novak. Next, let's try some kind of inheritance. So we're going to create another class, but it will be a subclass or a child of person. So it's going to be called neighbor. So this person is your neighbor and it's going to be derived from person. So the way you do it is semicolon and then the parent class. And it's going to have a, a new variable called neighborhood. And let's have a constructor and call it first name. So it's be very similar. So it's going to take in first name. It's going to take in last name, but it's going to take in a new argument called neighborhood. Let me correct the init spelling. And inside here, it's going to refer to self.neighborhood equals to neighborhood. But the rest of it will be very similar to its parent class. So first name will take in first name and last name will take in last name. And it will also have a function called full name. And I will have to say override so that it will override the same name, full name of the parent class. So full name will once again not take in any argument and instead it will return a string. Return first name and last name. But we will also say from which neighborhood. So this is the difference between the parent class function full name and the child class function full name. Why don't we try it out? So we'll say let n equals to neighbor and first name min last name on and then neighborhood min is from Stockholm. Let's print it out. We're going to have n dot full name. And why don't we try to execute it? And there you see Igor Novak, but the neighbor class will say from Stockholm, the neighborhood. So I hope that gave you a very brief overview of Swift programming language, but really it is just so, so much more. And Apple and the group of engineers are consistently uh, changing and improving the language. Currently it's version 2.2, but it is always going through all the changes. And there's a very, very detailed documentation on Swift programming language. Go online and have a look at it. So for the build link of the episode, I will actually say start developing iOS apps with Swift. And after you have gone through Swift, you can go through these examples to learn how to build iOS apps with Swift programming language. And yep, that's it for this week's episode of Build Podcast on Swift programming language. For all the previous episodes of Build Podcast, you can go to build-podcast.com and subscribe through RSS, iTunes, Vimeo, YouTube, GitHub, or Twitter. And I'll see you in the next episode of Build Podcast. Goodbye.